last hour of the day. <laughs> Sorry. So I'll tell you a story real quick. Uh, it is August of 1990. I am um, just got done with basic training at the Air Force Academy, and they bring us in to the Arnold Hall Auditorium. And as you may remember from basic training, you're in like a news blackout cycle. And they say, basics, it's time for us to tell you what's been going on in the world. And they said, you know, we, the United States may be on the brink of war. And I thought, yeah, right. You know, I've seen Top Gun. It's a little too convenient. You know, you get done with basic training. <laughs> this is what you've been trained for. And, it, it, it's, and they started to show us videos. And I thought, well, that's pretty impressive. How'd they get Dan Rather and Walter Cronkite to uh, uh, start talking about uh, this weird little country called Kuwait? and uh, the fact that it was just invaded by Iraq. And, and as the, the briefing went on, um, it became obvious that no, this is actually real. Uh, I was about to spend my first year at the Air Force Academy uh, watching uh, as the Air Force started preparing for first Operation Desert Shield and then Operation Desert Storm. Um, one of the coolest experiences that I had when I was there was in January of 1991. We're all glued to the little EGA monitors uh, watching CNN, because we could flip the monitor to receive a little RCA signal, and, and we saw the beginnings of the air war. And uh, we saw uh, Wolf Blitzer out in the middle of Baghdad, and we were watching it, and all of a sudden the report comes in that the first wave of uh, the attack was over and all the planes were accounted for. And there was this cheer that went up spontaneously around uh, the academy. It was one of the coolest moments of my life because just, just hearing that, that spontaneous eruption. And a couple days later, I heard General Horner uh, use a term I had never heard before, air supremacy. Yeah, he said, the way he described it, he, he said, even the birds flying over Iraq now have American stars and stripes painted on them somewhere. Uh, and that was 30 years ago. You know, so for, for my entire career, I, I'm 21 years uh, retired Air Force, um, we've had the expectation of air supremacy. We're, we've gotten good and gotten used to operating in an environment, at least in the air, where we know what we're doing, we're, we're the big, big dog on the block, no one's gonna challenge us. Uh, the Air Force has had a great origin story. You know, we, uh, we talked a lot uh, when I was a cadet about how, how important it was uh, that Air Force members, that airmen be led by officers who understand the unique aspects of the domain in which they fight. Cool. Well, right before I retired, I did a, a, a research project for the chief of staff, and it was trying to improve data flow to the cockpit. And I was the one nerd, I was the one non-pilot uh, on the study group. And while I was in Arizona, I heard a young captain say something which just tore my heart out. He said, yeah, you know, sir, we're the Air Force, so we deliver yesterday's solutions tomorrow. And I thought, oh my gosh, what just happened here? You know, the Air Force I joined and wanted to join was the Air Force that created things like the X-15 or the SR-71 or the Valkyrie. You know, some of these, these cool things. We didn't look to the airlines to see if we could catch up with them. And yet we were doing that. Uh, in fact, we're, the Air Force is about to be kicked out of some of the best airspace um, in the country because they can't keep up with the uh, ASDB radios uh, on their aircraft. They can't, they can't get, the, get it to work. And it turned out, uh, the conclusion we drew was that cyber um, was the reason that the Air Force is starting to fall behind dramatically, technically. And this is a pretty big existential threat. You know, the Air Force is supposed to be, of all the services, the service that is most capable of defending the nation in a high-tech manner. Um, and so what I want to talk about today is, are there some things that three decades of air supremacy have given us so much confidence that th with that confidence, we've now started to rely on some assumptions that are now hurting us in cyberspace. Um, so a little bit of my background. 
what just happened there. There we go. A uh, little bit of my background. I've, I've uh, 21 years Air Force. I've been uh, also doing this four years uh, as a consultant. Um, I've been a professor at the Air Force Academy, deputy head of the comp sci department. Um, also taught for the military strategic studies department. I've done, uh, I've caught hackers with the 33rd when it stood up in the late 90s. Um, head of the uh, cyber defense branch for the Air Force Research Lab. Um, uh, I, I currently, say again? Bill Geary. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, 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 I, and currently right now, I, I, one, of the, one of the jobs I do is I support um, uh, OSD doing a lot of the war games for their cyber resiliency exercises. So I want to give three observations uh, that I think we're, we're getting blinded by. So observation number one, defense is done by operators. Okay, and what, I mean, what do I mean by that? We hear a lot of times uh, uh, commanders say we need more cyber. Okay, pretty much every time we do a war game, we talk to the commanders, especially. Also, one, one more disclaimer, I am coming more from a weapon systems perspective. Cyber and weapon systems is kind of where I'm, I'm most interested in, not so much the, ge the general purpose IT system. So, so uh, you may have to make a slight adjustment. But, but when we talk to these uh, commanders of their weapon systems, we say, you know, how confident are you that your weapon system will survive a cyber engagement from an adversary? We get not very much. And uh, they, they say they know we need more cyber. Uh, one of the things, if you're in the military, right, the best thing to be as the commander, or the worst, depending on your position, the second best thing to be is the three, okay, the, the operations officer, because operators are the ones that do the fighting, okay? And if you can be the operations guy, that's the one that you want to be. Now, uh, the result of this is we tend to, and I think we're seeing this, the Air Force is right now looking at changing from, you know, the structure that it was to all cyber airmen are becoming more OCO and DCO focused. Okay. While we were doing an assessment of one of these weapon systems, one of the really brilliant MITRE engineers pointed out, uh, she said, you know, is your system, I know you want to defend it more, but is your system even defensible? And one of the things that, that uh, really resonated with me was that the Air Force doesn't really think about the concept of defensible ground, okay? In the air, there is no such thing as defensible ground. If you can get the high ground, that's good, but that's about it. You don't really worry about the terrain. It's not something that's in our DNA as an institution, okay? That picture there, anyone know where it's from? It's, pretty, it's a statue uh, on the valley wall of Thermopylae, okay? Uh, if you've seen the movie 300, uh, you've seen the, the, the story behind this. Okay? It's a great story of how a very small force of Greeks was able to withstand a far, far superior, uh, numerically superior force of Persians. Okay? The reason they were able to do it, they had defensible ground. Now, what do we mean in cyber when we say defensible ground. Is your system, especially your operational system, defensible? So perhaps I want to make, an, I've been kind of going over this in my head, I want to maybe offer one working de definition that if your system, if the mission to your system can be impacted by at most one vulnerability, by the exploitation of one vulnerability, including zero days, then your system is not defensible. Uh, we show over and over again um, uh, the, the commanders keep trying to, to, to patch their vulnerabilities and we, we ask them, well, what happens if they get into your system? Okay, because especially for a weapon system, an adversary is going to be patient, they're going to take their time, and you have to assume, it, because usually with a weapon system, there's an air gap. If you're going to jump that air gap, you're not going to risk it by doing a relatively common exploit that everyone's seen before that you can find with a NESA scan. Okay, you're probably going to use a zero day. You're probably going to do something pretty exotic. Uh, now, when we, we start talking for OSD, we, we keep noticing they want more cyber defenders, more cyber defenders. And what we argue is that the Air Force wants more cyber defenders. They probably need more cyber engineers. Probably some people who can look and make this system more defensible in the first place. 
Okay, now how does this differ from, from compliance personnel? Uh, in theory, your compliance personnel should make your system more defensible. The argument I would give is this. Let's say you were making a, bank, a banking system where you're going to deal with real money. Okay? Well, one way I could do that is build out my system, then you know, categorize it. It's probably going to be very high uh, on the categorization spectrum because I've got a, I'm dealing with real money and, I, and there's lots of people that are highly incentivized to break into my system. I'm going to then look at the recommended controls and implement all those controls and, and keep patching and trying to keep up with it and doing things in that way. If you did, that's basically the RMF process, right? I guarantee you someone's going to, we see systems built like this and people do really steal real money from systems built in that way every day, okay? Option two, uh, you could do that plus you could add cyber defenders, right? We're going to try and look for the bad guys, try and find people breaking in. Again, happens all the time, does work, but we still get stolen from. Option three, design your system to be defensible. Design your system to be able to operate in the presence of a, an exploit, and that exploit could come anywhere. Okay. And doing so, um, you're going to have to not defend the boxes, which is what, most commonly what you see in, in uh, IT systems. You have to start defending the mission. Now, an example of that would be Bitcoin. Right? The Satoshi paper assumes that multiple systems can be uh, compromised, will be compromised, okay? and it's designed to operate through that. Okay. Now, the problem is there's no way right now. Uh, uh, that the Air Force has, has the ability to ask for this. Okay? There is nothing that commander can do right now. We see lots of them that can say, okay, I want more cyber. Um, and and they usually can say, okay, well, we can send you more CPTs or maybe we can send you more MDTs. Okay? I am proposing here today, I've made this uh, to, to a couple places, the, uh, the possibility of a CET, a cyber engineering team that can look and start to examine your mission and say, are you, in fact, engineering your system well? Okay. That's, how, that's number one. Number two, air tasking orders are for planning. OK, I was going to say ATOs are for planning, but the problem is in this audience, you might say ATO, and they might think, oh, I'm already operating. No. OK, if you've ever dealt with the ATO process, it's an incredible thing. But it is based on a very air-specific reality. Okay? In the air, airplanes have very limited amount of fuel, and so you have to choreograph the air war. Right? Those airplanes have to be at a certain point at a certain time, and if they're not, they can't wait around very long. They only have a limited amount of fuel, and so when you're doing planning, uh, you need to figure out to a very specific degree where everything is going to be and make sure all these pieces come together. It's this three-day, 72-hour process. Uh, it's this assembly line of death. The key thing with an ATO, however, is the fundamental question you're asking is, where do you want the bombs? Okay. So what's the coordinates, x, y, and z, that you want the bombs to be? How big do you want the bomb? And when do you want the bomb to fall? Okay. And the ATO process really is designed around putting all those things together and making sure it all, all comes. Okay. As I said, it's a, uh, okay, let's see if this can work. It's a 72 hour process from beginning, you know, I'd like something to blow up till the time that, that bombs are in the air. Um, okay, let's move back here. There's a limited range of effects. Okay, a bomb only interacts with the physical environment in more or less one way. Okay, <laughs> that's usually not too good. Okay, but none of these things are really relevant to the cyber domain. Let's talk about the Intel Corporation. So at the Air Force Academy, um, the, the Intel Corporation is kind of interesting. The Air Force Academy right now is the only entity which has a direct relationship with the Intel Corporation. Now the reason they do that is because the Intel Corporation said, we don't want to have uh, uh, lots and lots of uh, relationships with the government. We only want to have one. And we want to make sure that um, this one relationship is going to be plausible enough that's not going to harm our international sales. So for instance, if the Intel Corporation had a joint research agreement with the NSA, that would probably tank all of their international sales all over the world. But they said, okay, the Air Force Academy is a military institution. It's close enough out west. 
um, we, can, we can couch it at, with an academic research thing. Pretty cool. One of the things they did was they taught us how they did their form of planning. Now for the Intel Corporation, when they plan for building a new chip, it takes 10 years from the time they say, gee, I'd like to build a new microprocessor until the time it rolls off um, the assembly line and is starting to be operationally used and sold in CPUs. 10 years. Okay, now if you think about it, what would it take for you to start planning what CPUs would look like in 2029? Okay, if you can imagine how difficult that is. Well, what they said, which is really surprising, and they actually offered to the federal government, they said, look, we're going to teach you how we do planning. Okay, and uh, it's pretty interesting. They said, here's the thing, it begins with storytelling. So they hire a whole bunch of storytellers, and the Intel Corporation will look and they'll say, okay, what would a computer in 2029 look like? And they write a whole bunch of stories, and they just write them out, and they put them all together. And then they start grouping them, and they say, okay, what stories are the good stories we'd like to tell, and what stories are the bad stories that we would like to see, uh, we would like to see not come true? And they start to think about, you know, what are the common threads in the good stories, and what are the common threads in the bad stories? And then from there, they start to figure out, okay, well, this is how we're going to make our CPU. And then they start to worry about the technology. One of the things we found when we were doing Wargaming, at first, uh, we started looking at availability, right? A typical uh, cyber attack, usually, and we saw this, we even saw this with Russia when they did the uh, invasion of Abkhazia and Ossetia uh, in, in 2008. A, ju a junior varsity player, when they're doing cyber attacks, they're gonna, they're gonna do availability attacks. They're going to you know, do denial of service. They're going to try and turn your system off, okay? As you get more mature, you're going to start getting into integrity attacks. Okay? And integrity attacks are kind of interesting because they're very, very open-ended. In effect, if you're going to do planning with an integrity attack, you have to start asking, what lie do I want to tell? So what lie do I want to tell? Who do I want to tell it to? And who is, who is going to be doing the telling? And then under what conditions? Okay? That is a very different challenge than where do I want the bomb and how big do I want it to be. Okay. When we did red teaming, all, um, we noticed that we would bring in a lot of folks, including from NSA and, and some, some really decent people, folks that could write a you know, buffer <laughs> overflow attack, folks that knew you know, how to break your router 10 ways from Sunday. And we said, okay, let's assume you have access. Let's assume somehow there's a way to get in. What are you gonna do next? We would get crickets. And after seeing this over and over and over again, I realized, you know, the Air Force isn't training people to start thinking about how to attack in cyberspace. It's a real world example. Uh, 1999, I'm on the ops floor at the 33rd down in San Antonio, and we caught a guy breaking into a uh, Solaris computer. Okay, we watched him do it. It was a lot easier back then when it was just Telnet and everything was unencrypted. It was, but it was pretty cool. It's like, oh, cool, there's the buffer overflow. There's how you get in. We watched through the little soda straw lens of the, uh, of the command line as he starts you know, looking around the system. While we're doing that, we call up uh, uh, the base and we said, hey, by the way, here's the IP. This is under attack. It's just been compromised. And the guy goes nuts. What's going on? He goes, well, that particular, at the time, that particular system contained was the master database that contained all the orbital vectors of everything we were traveling, we were tracking around the planet. And we were like, now the good news was the guy didn't know what he had. Okay, if he did, he could have crashed the space shuttle back when that was flying. Um, but the, it, it once again illustrated to me the fact that the attacker was so focused on how to get in, and from the defender side, we're often so focused to keep people from getting out that we stopped asking the questions, once you're in, what do you do next? And how do we plan for that? Uh, both from the defensive side, because if you understand, if you start telling stories to each other about what would, what would an attacker likely do next that would really mess up your day. Okay, I'll give you one more example. Uh, we asked the, uh, the superintendent of the Air Force Academy, what would be the thing if an attacker broke into your network that would get you fired? Any guesses? 
football ticket sales. Okay, it turns out we invite 50,000 people to watch our football games every year, and at the time, the football ticket sales uh, were being transmitted over an unsecured Wi-Fi network uh, all the way to, to, to the athletic center. And it's like, you know, ma'am, imagine someone coming in, sitting down with a sniffer, and then receiving the credit card numbers of all of the neighbors that you just invited in. That will get you fired. <laughs> but if you start thinking in terms of stories, you can start really planning and preventing uh, some of your attacks. Okay? Now the problem is who can fill this gap? Is anybody trained to do this today in the Air Force? Do we encourage our folks to start telling stories and to start thinking in terms of what would I do next? Number three, uh, the randomness of fog and friction. So if you talk about randomness okay, in warfare, Okay, it's an old concept. When Julius Caesar crosses the Rubicon, okay, as he's about to plunge the Roman Empire into a huge challenge, he says, the die is cast. In other words, we're going to roll the dice and see what happens. Okay, today, if you talk about fog and if you talk about randomness and you look up in the doctrine, you're going to see fog and friction as, as generally being the overall concepts that cover that. Um, and that's not bad, but it's incomplete. Okay, so I want to play some dice games with you for a minute. So let's say you take three dice, you shake them up, you roll them, and you add up the results. Okay? Well, you'll probably get a result that, you'll, if you uh, calculate the probability of you getting a different result, it'll look like that. Okay, what does that look like? Normal distribution, a bell curve, yeah. Um, by the way, has anyone actually taken three dice, rolled them, and ad added up the results? Okay, and then maybe assign them to strength, intelligence, dexterity, <laughs> wisdom. <laughs> Some people probably play Dungeons and Dragons. That's exactly what that's based on, okay? Um, and Dungeons and Dragons actually uh, has a, a tie to wargaming as well, okay? It was Gary Gygax actually was playing a medieval war game, and uh, then all of a sudden he had the idea, instead of them facing more knights in the castle, he put a dragon on the other end. The guys that played with him thought that was so cool, and then... D&D was born, okay? But this works pretty well for describing physical systems because strength does show up on a bell curve. Intelligence, you know, at least measured by IQ, does show up on that bell curve, okay? It shows up over and over again. And so these dice games actually do make sense for war games because they're pretty good at modeling physical systems, okay? Um, but I want to show you another dice game. Okay, so in this game, and I'll explain why this works a little bit later on, but you roll the dice, if you get an even number, stop, you're done, you get no points, go away. If you roll an odd number, you get one point, and you get to roll again. And then from that point on, every time you roll an odd number, you get to double your score and go again. And you keep going and going again until you get an even number and then you stop, okay? Now, if you plot the probability, this is what you'll get. Okay, a couple things to notice. Most people get what for a score? Even. Most, yeah, about half will get it even, they'll get nothing. Some people will get points, and some people will get a lot of points, and some small percentage will get a heck of a lot of points. Okay? Now, this, what I've just described to you, is a, um, the mathematical term for this is a power law distribution. If you've ever heard the concept of the 80-20 rule, you've just encountered a power law distribution. Okay? If you've seen Occupy Wall Street, like 99% of the people, 1% of the people have 99% of the wealth and vice versa, that is another example of the power law distribution. Anytime you have a situation where most of people get one th get nothing and a lot, I'm sorry, most people get nothing and a small percentage get just about everything, you're encountering a power law distribution. Now, why does this matter? Turns out, Cyber systems show over and over again power law distributions. Why do I care about that? Well, our brains are used to dealing with randomness, but the randomness they're used to dealing with is a randomness we encounter in a normal distribution, and the Air Force has evolved in the exact same way. And so my argument is, uh, we'll show you why, but if you're playing the wrong game, you're much more likely to lose. Okay, now, where does this show up? Okay, 
So in 1999, a group of Notre Dame mathematicians started to examine the structure of the internet. And specifically, they started to examine at first the structure of the World Wide Web. And they said, what are the odds that someone is going to uh, link to your particular web page? And they assumed that it would be a normal distribution, right? Most people you know, would get a few links. A couple people were very, had very popular web pages. And a few people would have very, very unpopular web pages. You know. What they found? It was a power law distribution. Most people got never, never got linked to. Some people got linked to a lot. Okay? Structure of networks. People used to ask us over and over again, what is the structure? I want a map of my networks, uh, uh, of the network that I have. And it usually looks something like that thing on the left, which is a, uh, a, a map of the internet, according to one visualization. Okay? Guess what? It's a power law distribution. You know how you can tell? The firework distribution. See the center of those fireworks? There's something there that everything is linking to. And it's important. Okay. So if you understand that, oh, this is power law distribution, you'll understand why that network map looks the way it does. And you ought to be asking yourself, because another uh, power laws uh, distributions are also what they call scale-free distributions, meaning that that structure will show up at every base, at every MAGCOM, at the national level and the international level. It always shows up at each level. You can be, um, another way of putting this uh, income distribution is a power law distribution. You can be the richest man in the world and the disparity is huge. You can also be the richest man in town. The disparity is still big, okay, just for a smaller local area. Uh, this is also, by the way, why the Kevin Bacon game works and why you can receive Netflix, okay? Because some of those people, like Kevin Bacon, are connected to a lot of different actors because they show up, they act in a lot of different movies. And a small, most actors only show up in one, maybe two movies. Okay. In the network structure, some of those hubs are massive and they receive all the important links. And that is why the diameter of the network, the time to go from side A to side B is much smaller because we have these key centers at the center of those fireworks that put it all together. Uh, software library dependencies show up as power law distributions. Most libraries only get to be used by one or two uh, programs. Some get to be used by a lot. Uh, effectiveness of malware. Most malware is seen only once um, in the wild and never seen again. But then every now and then you get the heart bleed virus, which shows up and affects everybody. Uh, network traffic patterns. Most people, if you, if you have an IP uh, to IP connection, most traffic never occurs. But then every now and then you'll see Everyone jumps onto and, and, and hits one particular network, network thing, and we call it a network storm. Okay? Um, all of these things, uh, the researchers found out that any process that exhibits growth, it's something that's growing, it's something that's changing, and preferential attachment. Uh, the idea is if something is working, more people want to get on board with that. Okay, you've seen a video. Once someone sees a video, then they share it with someone else, and then they share it, and they share it. And if it's good, it keeps growing and growing and growing, goes viral. Okay, that's an example of preferential attachment. In short, this is a, a mathematical uh, fingerprint for evolution. Okay, now why is that important? Your networks did not, were not designed, your networks evolved. Okay, so stop treating them like they, they were designed. Okay, they weren't. Uh, we can show it. Okay, but this is the one I want to talk about where it really shows up, and that is in the physical world. How do we create our force? Okay, so in the Air Force, right, we have these things called recruiters, and they recruit and they care about how many people do they get and what is their average quality. Okay, now when we put people through basic training, right, we know some people are going to be are going to suck and some people are going to be awesome. Okay, but we don't care. Okay, we care about the average, and we discount the extremes. Okay. Now the reason we do this is because what we care about fundamentally is the power of teams. Okay. If you are part uh, fighting in the physical world, it's about numbers. Okay. Imagine if you are a six sigma pilot. You are a one in a million pilot. How many aircraft are you going to shoot down in the course of your career? Maybe two. If you're lucky. Yeah. Zero. Maybe zero. There's a good chance you, you could be a one in a million pilot and you'll shoot down not a plane. Okay. Now, if you do that, are you going to, if you're a, a one in a million pilot, are you really going to affect an entire air campaign? Probably not. Probably not. 
the, go, the guy, your wingmen who are, are good enough, if they're, if they're trained well enough, will probably be good enough. Which is why the Air Force says, hey, pilot, now that you've made field grade officer, it's time for you to get out of the, out of the cockpit and start leading people because we need good pilots, we need good leaders desperately, and even if you're a one in a million pilot, you're really not gonna make that much of a difference, so it's, we're gonna, we'll, we'll take the hit. There are professions that deal in the power law world, okay, and they look very, very different, okay? So, uh, usually power law uh, professions, if you're producing something which is non-rival, if you're an author, if you're a singer, if you are a model, okay, and your image can be copied, when we say non-rival, we mean that the, the product can be replicated over and over again, and if I have it, so can you at no cost, okay? So an F-16 is a rival product. If I have it, you can't. An exploit is a non-rival product. I can have it, and you can have it, and we all can have it, and it doesn't diminish its quality. Now, professions that deal with power law um, focus, I'm sorry, with, with, with these products, we only care about the extremes. We do not care about the average, okay? Think about the average musician. He's probably, or the typical musician, right? Nobody thinks about that, right? <laughs> he's probably the musician that's playing piano in the mall, okay? And if he's lucky, you know, he might be able to, you know, afford Taco Bell at the end of the night, the $5 box, right? We care on a power law uh, career field about the extreme. Who is the top 10? Okay, likewise for authors. Who is that New York Times bestseller list? Okay, for uh, professional athletes, okay, who is going to make the pro team? For, um, uh, Supermodels, right? If you have one name that you're known by, you know, congratulations. Okay, let's go back to that dice game. The reason the dice game models power laws is it's a tournament. Okay, imagine you roll the dice, you roll odd, you lost to somebody. Okay, you roll, I'm sorry, you roll even, you lost to somebody, you roll odd, okay, you get to move up to the next level of the tournament and you roll again, and you move up to the next level of the tournament and the next level of the tournament. And each time, with each step, there are fewer and fewer people that are you're competing against, but the rewards go up per, uh, exponentially. This is why American Idol works, you know, the TV show used to work so well, because you're watching that tournament take place. Okay? Now, these professions that take place with power law distribution, they're recruited very differently. You do not send a recruiter for, for musicians or athletes and say, hey, I got 5,000 athletes recruited for you know, the Denver Broncos. You only want to find that one guy. They're trained and developed very differently. Okay, if you're an author and you write a New York Times bestseller, nobody is going to pick you out and say, hey, congratulations. It's time for you to manage and mentor other authors. We're, you're done writing now. Let's have you move into a leadership position. And they're compensated very differently, right? The person that found the person that is the editor of the author, the person that is uh, uh, the agent of the supermodel gets some money, but the model, the talent itself, they get a lot. Now, um, and these work because it's not the power of teams. It's not, the, it's not based on the power of a bunch of people to work together to solve these big problems. It's based on the power of a good idea or something compelling, something that's going to capture attention or eyeballs. So what about tech? Well, let's look at this, salary. Tech is kind of in, in between. If my daughter came to me and said, Dad, I want to be a musician, I would probably cry. If she said, Dad, I want to be a physical therapist, okay, good, she'll have a good average salary. Tech, you can have a pretty good average salary. However, when we go to the extremes, the richest men in the world are also all in tech. The Jeff Bezos, Bill Gates, all those folks. Recruiting. We recruit a lot of average cyber folks, but we also look for some very, in industry, we look for very, very specific people. You may have seen some of the Google job applications where um, if you search for very specific patterns and strings, they might say, congratulations, we think that you have the horsepower 
to become a Google employee, and they'll go after people individually. Development. Usually these people will, um, in, in a power law world, we're generally speaking going to put them together with other superstars and have them rub off on each other. Uh, Palo, the Palo Alto Research Lab is a great example of that. So, um, and disruptive potential. If you are a dentist, okay, a, a, a physical world type career field, you may fill, you may be a Six Sigma dentist. You may be a one in a million dentist that can do such beautiful fillings and root canals that people just are in awe. It's, it's like you have velvet hands reaching into the person's mouth, but it's not gonna change the industry. But one Six Sigma cyber person can, okay? For the good and for the bad. My company learned that the hard way, right? We hired Ed, Ed, Edward Snowden for two weeks and then he, he got what he wanted and left. Daggummit. Now, the question is, is a good idea, how could that affect a cyber campaign? What is the power of that? If so, perhaps we need to start treating cyber in the way we deal with people, more like the cyber career fields, or the power law career fields we talked about earlier, the musicians, the authors, and less like the basic trainees that we have, you know, when we bring in a bunch of folks in the army. And this may be a bridge too far, um, but perhaps it's worth looking at it because the Air Force is kind of stuck in between these two realms. So in summary, uh, in 1984, there was an author that published a book called The Neuromancer. And in this book, he basically described a world where a bunch of people got together and plugged into a network and they enjoyed a, sh a common shared reality. It became the basis for the movie The Matrix. Okay? But the idea is that they, the, this group of people created this shared illusion, okay, because they wanted to. Okay? One of the challenges in being with such a successful uh, entity as the Air Force, which has really had a lot of well-earned successes, is that the stories you tell each other might blind you to some of the new realities that are coming up against you. And so um, all the, 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 the the, the successes we've had in the Air Force in the physical world may be hurting us when it comes to the cyber campaign. Okay, and so uh, once again, uh, if we're going to fly, fight, and win, we may need to reassess these. Both um, the fact that cyber engineers and not operators should be the ones that should be so crucial to the defense of your system that uh, right now our planners really don't know how to I don't think are terribly well equipped to plan in a cyber campaign. And that the way we recruit, develop, and compensate our cyber personnel may need to start looking like the power law professions and not the way we're doing it today. So with that, any questions? This is awesome. Sure, I've got one for you, sir. Uh, in your time, really, when you were working with the 33rd and I suppose uh, wherever else, mm -hmm. this gets into your, uh, your point about the planning and more so at the, the top level, what kind of terms did you and your team use? Did you use cyber specific terms or did you use air specific terms? Because something that seems to have happened lately, I work in a network operations center, mm -hmm. is we use terms like flying sorties to refer to our missions. Yeah. We call them access missions or escort missions. We refer to the time we spend in a, in a when I say we, I mean one rows, time they spend in an adversarial system as time on target. Yep. Terms that we're, we're not pretending to be fighter pilots here, but I feel that when we provide these in briefings to our senior leaders, they're probably not getting what we're trying to tell them. And in part that may be because they don't understand our actual capabilities. Yeah, so we had to, trans so, so it's so funny because like, we would have to translate all the time um, into pilot speak. And uh, uh, that, that just was a constant challenge for us. And, and that's one of the, and, and so yeah, exactly. I, it's a little depressing to me that 20 years, you know, after we were doing the same thing, that that is still occurring. Uh, and, and, and in a sense, it's a real, almost a repudiation of the Air Force origin story. Um, because what we've said was fundamentally, look, airmen have the right to be led by officers that understand the unique aspects of the domain in which they fight. And if, if you're doing that, that represents, in my mind, a fundamental failure of, of who we are. I, I think you're absolutely right on that. I think a 
comparison would be in the earliest days of air war, you know, let's say around the time of the First World War, if we were forced to, or rather if the air service were forced to refer to its engagements as uh, air bayonet fights because the infantry officers couldn't understand the concept of yeah. dogfight. Yeah, exactly. And so what happened as a result of that many years after? Split off. Yeah. Precisely. And yeah. I think and so, that we do need to go in that direction. But that's well, just, there's, uh, so Joint Hub 5, uh, ops planning, I'm forgetting since I cannot believe I'm forgetting some steps, but uh, you start with strategic guidance and what are you trying to accomplish? You talk about, you describe your current system mm -hmm. and then you describe your desired state. Desired state, yes. You know, the thing that separates you from where you want to be is called the problem and then you build the commander's intent and the ops plan, that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, I give four, four warnings for everybody. I, live and breathe in the desired state, and I'm calling you to join me there. Uh, so to the extent that you saw the break from Army to Air, at that time they didn't understand, it's a, they didn't understand, I don't I'd, I'd like to understand where the word domain was first introduced. Maybe they did understand the concept, but we use that all the time nowadays. And what needs to happen is, what's going on right now is we're having a lot of discussions in the current state. You're at this measurement, now let's move Three inches further, ah, success. <laughs> You're still in the current state, all yeah. right? So we need to build the desired state and then migrate that. To and we're not that. telling ourselves stories to get there. No. And so um, I'm, I'm working on a paper in my head that this is about re-architecting how we defend a nation. And so I'm going, and I love your words, you put an organized training, we have forces in the domain in which they fight. So. Um, we have, we have services, and the definition of a joint response is a combination of more than one service. All right, so what I'm going to architect is domains. We organize training equipped according to domains. So if you operate on the land, you're in the land domain. Air domain exists above your head until you run out of oxygen. At that time, it becomes the space domain. Uh, cyber, we, we added space to the Air Force and right. the Air and Space Force. So it was kind of sort of first. The cyber was the first one to stand up and say the fifth domain. All right, so we're going to organize training and equip cyber forces just as we have air domain. And you operate in the air, just currently know about airmen, people who operate in the air, fly things. Great. I don't do that. Army guys didn't do it in World War I. You know, so we're, we're trying to fork with a spoon right now. Mm -hmm. All right, because we're still in this current state trying to move three millimeters further than we were yesterday. So if we organize training equip a cyber forces, so we have air forces, naval forces, space forces, land forces, cyber forces. I can organize training equip for the cyber forces, and I can get into this thing. In the commercial world, we have, uh, we operate on the uh, ABC model, so we have an A, your, your power law, your horse, that's your CCIE. Uh, network terms, Cisco certified internet network expert, and then you have a, a handful of CCMPs, and you have a lot of CCNAs, and you grow A's to P's, P's to E's. Mm -hmm. um, so, but all they're doing, all we're doing is networking. Yeah. I'm not being pulled off, well, and as a, as a guard guy, I'm a traditional guard guy, so when we get them out two weeks here, I do this. But when I'm not doing this, I'm hands on route switch, voice wireless in the, the, the only Fortune 500 company in Alabama, and then the next largest Fortune company, 700 something bulk materials, so uh, Regents Bank. So, but that's all I did, yeah. is Monday through Friday, I'm route switch voice wireless. Occasionally, like once a year, get interrupted for some process. How often are you interrupted? I don't even know if you're able to see, but whatever it is, yeah, you're you're one to exactly two, is it, is it single digits? <laughs> Uh, I don't think I can go 20 minutes. I'm at COSC, the network uh, operations shop at the uh, IMS West. I don't right. think I can go 20 minutes, even back when I was doing more technical work before management. So I don't think I could go 20 minutes without being pulled aside for either a meeting or a phone call or some sort of additional duty. I can only imagine how good I would have been at routing the switches had I actually done that all day every day. Right. Now then, yeah. I love the military. I love the military. <laughs> uh, almost 20 years. Almost there. So love calm, love the military, um, but the, the military is a self looking ice cream cone. Yeah. The military is inside of a, a mirror cube, and when the mirror when the, when it looks at itself in the mirror, it wants to reflect back itself. It's behavioronics. 
you need to foul it, you need to wear the right clothes, you need to wear the right things, if you don't salute the general's car when it's driving past you, we're going to have a discussion about that in like three or four hours out of that day, right? You know what you intend to sir? Correct. You know, the military, military needs to military, and it needs to do military stuff. But these are, you know, I'm going to take my point. You got a couple quick hands in the back. I think the show will have his hand up first. Okay. I just had a story because you were talking about telling stories. I was in AFSOC from 2009 to 2015, and I was honored to, to lead the electronic flight back initiative before EFB was even term. Okay. And mm -hmm. ended up flying with a vice commander. I was testing nine different devices illegally in the plane. And, but we had top cover from a lieutenant colonel that was like, hey, you guys got this idea, run with it. And uh, ended up flying to Maxwell, actually, Air Force Base. And a big thunderstorm came in, and I had, I had a, a, an iPad. And it was a perfect time, and I came in, I had my briefing on the iPad, and I had said, hey, sir, we can't take off, there's a huge thunderstorm outside, and I, I gave him the iPad using for flight, and I showed him, here's the thunderstorm, here's the approach leading out of here, and he's like, what is this thing? Yep. And I said, oh, this is uh, an electronic flight bag. And he goes, oh, I've never seen one of these, and I was like, well, check it out. So, you know, he, he freaked out on the spot, because he <laughs> saw the technology, and then he said to me, Hey, call me tomorrow. Oh, you can't call me. You're just the captain. And then, it, and then two weeks later, 300 iPads showed up at our squadron. And, <laughs> and so we, and this is like late 2009, early 2010. So I'm in combat, flying with an iPad, with the most classified plane, which one of the most classified planes, a U-28 at the time. I don't know if it's still as classified, but back then it was super classified. And so here we are testing the iPad downrange. 2010 in combat, and Vance Air Force Base just got iPads at the beginning of this year in AATC. Yeah. So I, I came back to Vance Air Force Base in 2015. I was so frustrated with the Air Force for a lack of innovation. I separated in 2017 to start a company to do innovation for the Air Force because they won't freaking do it for themselves. So there's a story for you if you need a story of yeah. like. We saw over and over so again where the pilots were yes. bypassing. Um, uh, the comm squadron. It's like we would go to the flight line and talk to the, the pilots, and we got stories like that all the time. And then we would go to the comm squadron, and we'd be like, "So tell us about your network. And what about those pilots?" And they're like, "Oh yeah, they don't do anything." <laughs> it yeah. was it was unbelievable because we're doing all of their jobs, like yeah. all of them. We're doing DTS for them, or because of these terrible pieces of software that suck that we have to use that wastes all of our time that we can't freaking fly airplanes. Yeah. So like th that frustration. I mean, I, I separated. Completely separated to start my own company at 13 years active duty, no retirement, no nothing, to to innovate. Now the good news is you're on the power law distribution pay scale, not the. Well, now I'm on this crazy because innovate wasn't even a word in 2015, and now it's like almost a curse word. There's like too much innovation. Like ah, oh, stop it. You're like, and the reason why people are saying stop it is because you're not solving their freaking problems. Yeah, we haven't you're creating more problems. We're still talking about it, so that's good news. Well, but, but they're creating more problems. Like they they create something. And, they're, and, they're, and then they shove it on their throat. You could say PEX or EPEX or TIMS or MICT or name a freaking software that's terrible, right? That when you just log into the network, it takes you 10 minutes to log in, right? So how do we solve problems? So if you can log in at all. Yeah, if you can log in at all. So, so we chose the domain of basically smartphones because all the airmen have smartphones. And so we're solving that in a core, core platform called BaseConnect so our users are giving a, I have so many ideas, we have thousands of users. Now, here's a question though. I mean, so, so and, and this is probably the last one, uh, I, I do want to honor people's time. It is 650, feel free to go if, if you need to. I think we'll, we'll kind of like just do more of a one-on-one a, a -on -one or discussions. But uh, most phones have software defined radios in them. Could a, could a phone be turned into a transmitter? Could that phone st uh, start broadcasting GPS? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so, so we talked to the pilots and we said, okay, how many pilots fly with an iPhone that they own and it's that the Air Force has never seen, touched, or is even aware of? All of them. They all do, right? And so we started to say, okay, what are the odds that I could start mucking with the aircraft through the iPhone in the pilot's pocket? Zero. Uh, I disagree. I could probably pull that, that that aircraft off course if I wanted to. Prove it. Well, more, more. We have. 
more problem. I, I, saw, I saw stuff in the Army where they were actually giving away troop positions because they had phones and the GPS trackers. Ask the pilot if he wants to know where the enemy Forget taking over the airplane. You, you did that with figure out phone. where your phone is and where the airplane off? is. Off? Yeah. I did that. That's a bigger problem. problem. Yeah. They did it with a phone off? No, not off. Okay. There's a big difference because, right, we had a young lieutenant. We're flying in a place we're not supposed to fly. He left his phone on on takeoff and he got put on the terrorist watch list by the time we landed. <laughs> and that went through the whole chain of command, and our colonel pulled him in and was like, Hey, dude, I understand you had your phone on you because here's your name literally on the list. So we had to go through this whole process to get him off the list. And then we explained to everyone else, make sure your phone is in airplane mode. Right? Because somehow he connected to a tower in that country, and it's like, why is there a US phone number? Why is there this and this and this? And, and by the time we land, it's like, oh my gosh. So you learn to turn your phone off when you go to places like that. So I would say, I, I mean, but what you're, what you're saying though is, and that's what we ran into, is that instead of innovating, we come up with a lot of reasons why we can't. Versus exactly. the question of how can we? Okay, I understand what you're saying, but how can we fly with a phone? Okay, we turn it to, to do not disturb, we turn it to airplane mode, we turn it off during certain uh, right. areas. But I'm willing to take the risk here because it saves me 10 hours like to just follow a flight plan. Oh my gosh. Right. I take a right. electronic form and we print it off and we fill it out by paper and then we fax it and then they make a copy of it and then the student makes a copy of it. Something that's electronic, I can literally not in my flight suit do in 30 seconds from my phone. It takes 20 minutes. Yeah, when the reserve pilots on our team that would fly for the airlines would show the, the iPad that Delta Airlines or, or United would give them to the active duty flyers, it was so different, night and day. Um, I loved your analogy of like, you know, Chuck Yeager, when we did innovate at like, so, you know, what happened to the space program type stuff? Like, we were like, you know, this has never been done before. Right. We didn't look to the airlines. The Air, Air Force I joined did not look to the airlines for inspiration of how to do technology. And now they do. Yeah, now they do, right? We, the airlines look to us. So I think that's kind of an existential threat. And now the airlines are still our pilots. <laughs> and that's why we're 2,000 short. There's yeah. a whole separate side note for that. But. Yeah. Well, I think that's the last thing separating you all from break. And so thank you for coming. And hope you enjoyed it.